Hello everyone. Good evening and greetings of the day and welcome you all. I am Keshav Samadhi, serving president at uh, SPI CSI Chandigarh chapter. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Bharat Rajgopalan, director at uh, ST Microelectronics USA. He will uh, give a uh, talk uh, which will have uh, and, uh, some information regarding the AR VR technologies and uh, their uh, applications and things. Uh, brief and uh, shortly, our chapter advisor, Dr. Umesh Tiwari, will uh, introduce him. Uh, before that, uh, I will uh, let me uh, explain the structure of the talk. Uh, after the introduction, of our speaker, uh, he will uh, take the talk, and after the talk, we will take question answer session. Uh, those questions which are in chat will be taken first. Then after that, uh, you will be asked to unmute yourself and uh, direct your question to our uh, speaker. And after that, there will be conclusion of the talk. So I request everyone in between the talk if you have any question. So put your qu uh, query in the chat. Uh, don't put anything else uh, other than the, uh, your query in the chat box. Only the queries which you have. And if you are not able to uh, write down your query, then after the uh, uh, chat box queries, we will uh, ask you to unmute and direct your question. So in today's, uh, in today's uh, webinar, more than uh, 35 uh, students around the world registered for our this talk, and uh, we are uh, glad to have uh, Dr. Bharat as our speaker. And now I request our doctor, uh, our advisor, Dr. Umesh Tiwari, to kindly introduce our speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kesa. A uh, very good evening uh, to all of you. A warm welcome, uh, a warm welcome to our uh, today eminent speaker and all the attendees from India and abroad. So uh, it is my uh, great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Bharat Raj Gopalan. So uh, Dr. Bharat Raj Gopalan is a director of strategic marketing at ST Microelectronics and responsible for developing the company strategy for augmented reality, leveraging ST broad technology and product portfolio. Dr. Bharat is a veteran of the electronic industry, having served in technical, managerial, and executive role in research and development, manufacturing product development and marketing. Prior to the ST, he has held a number of leadership positions, including roles at Microvision, Dolby Laboratories, Texas Instruments, and IBM in semiconductor technology development and manufacturing, display technology development and imaging system. Dr. Bharat, hold MS and PhD degrees in electrical engineering and he also hold an MBA. So with that, once again, I welcome Dr. Bharat and request him to deliver the today talk. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Tiwari. Uh, and thank you very much, Keshav as well, uh, both of you for, uh, for the invitation. It's my honor to be here and to uh, speak with uh, speak with all of you. So thank you so much and a good evening to everybody. Uh, and thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so the title of my talk is uh, Laser Beam Scanning for Near to Eye Display. And as I bring up my presentation now, I will say a few background words to, to motivate uh, today's, uh, today's discussion. Uh, hopefully you can all see this, and if you cannot see this, uh, Keshav, please let me know as well. So, so before I jump into the details of the talk, I think it's a few words about laser beam scanning, a few words about augmented reality. 
Uh, as a lot of you probably know, uh, over the last number of years, there's been quite a bit of activity in augmented reality, uh, most notably big companies like uh, Microsoft, uh, like Facebook, uh, like Google, uh, like Apple, and others have uh, investing quite a bit of uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, technology in R and D uh, across the spectrum in order to develop uh, so-called augmented reality, which I'll talk about in definitions in a moment. And augmented reality is very important, particularly now with COVID nineteen, uh, in that it can allow uh, remote work remote assistance, uh, work from home. Uh, the future of work is changing quite a bit uh, as we go towards more of a, a digital work uh, environment. Uh, you know, we'll have increasing use of these kind of technologies to, to augment, uh, quite frankly, uh, our work and our life and our experience. So that's the motivation for the talk. And, 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 and this is such a broad topic. There are so many technologies to cover. It, you, know, you cannot cover all of that in one hour or even in one day, I would say. So today I'll give a broad brush survey of the overall field. I'll, I will then go into detail in some critical technology areas, particularly as it uh, pertains to uh, imaging and display systems, and more specifically uh, using what's called laser beam steering or laser beam scanning for near to eye display. There's a lot of optics as well that are involved here, a lot of electronics, a lot of systems considerations. So we'll try to cover as much as possible to give all of you an appreciation of what it takes in order to be able to achieve uh, such devices, such technologies, such capabilities, and then hopefully motivate you to do further research for the work in this area. So with that, let me, uh, and by the way, uh, one other thing, a lot of you may not be aware, ST Microelectronics is not a household name, but we are a fairly large uh, semiconductor company. We are headquartered in uh, Geneva, uh, and most of our manufacturing operations are in France and Italy for, uh, for, for our semiconductor wafers. And then our back end or packaging assembly is in Europe as well as uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and so we are about 40,000 people uh, worldwide. Thing from uh, sensors and actuators such as gyroscope, magnetometers, uh, pressure sensors, so on and so forth, uh, to imaging sensors, to time of flight, uh, to CMOS emit sensors, to microcontrollers, to a whole ho and uh, silicon germanium, silicon carbide, gallium nitride. We have a whole host of uh, technologies and devices that, that we produce and manufacture. So that's what we do. Okay, so let me go into the, so let me let me start the presentation and start step by step with high level details and go into a more and more uh, details. Okay, so let me start at the very broadest broader scale. So when you look at the and the evolution of what we call uh, human machine interaction, this is a really important point to consider because you know, we. You know, the last uh, you know, years or so, in terms of how human beings uh, use machines and how human beings interact with machines, and so if you look at really early days of how people uh, work with machines, which is data processing pretty much, people used key punch cards. This a lot of you are very very young, probably have no idea what that is, but in the upper left hand side, people used to code their programs, code their data in punch card, which are read by mechanical machines tabulated and electronically uh, then processed. And so in the early days, it was all about data processing, you know, crunching numbers as they used to call that. And the user experience to interact with the machine is what I call linear or 1D. That means basically you have a keyboard, you've got a, a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, 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 a bunch of keypads and terminals, and then you just type it in a linear of way uh, commands or instructions. And that was true for many years from the 50s to the 70s, uh, when you went from a simple keyboard to a simple monitor, uh, it was still very much a linear experience. Things started to shift around the 1980 timeframe uh, when Apple in the early days uh, came out with their, uh, with their Macintosh computers, Apple IIe and the Macintosh computers, which then gave something called a mouse at that time, which is very new, very novel 
because now you have more degrees of freedom. You can now uh, interact with the machine uh, in 2D rather than 1D in a plane. It was more about information processing, not just data processing, number crunching, more information processing. And the way you interact with the machine is through windows and menus, icons, and over time you added pointers and touch to it. And so from the 1980s till about now, it, the, the interaction that we have with our machines, our smartphones, our computers, our tablets, it's, it's, it's still a, a 2D experience. Now, where things become interesting, where things are changing kind of very rapidly, what I call spatial or 3D user, user experience, and the, from a competition perspective, you're going to a whole new domain, which people are calling visual and spatial computing. This is a completely entirely new domain, which is unlike uh, what we've done before. Um, and, and really the modality of interaction of how you work with the machine is about what we call speaking to the machine, like Alexa, for example, or, or that you may be familiar with, a grasp, gaze, gesture, something much more natural. And so that whole paradigm is what uh, everyone is excited about now and what people are driving towards now. And we're investing billions of dollars to develop technologies to enable that to occur. So this is sort of a quick historical snap snapshot to give a motivation for why we're doing it and what we're going towards. And we want to get to a point where man and machine uh, become indistinguishable. Is that a good thing? I'm not so sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but certainly that's where we're going as, as, a, as, a, as a civilization. Okay, some definitions. So we've heard lots of things in the, more, in, in the world today. You've heard about something called VR, virtual reality, AR, augmented reality, MR, mixed reality. I think, uh, Keisha, you mentioned that you were at Photonics Express last year. I'm sure you saw all these terms and all these technologies there. So very briefly, the difference between each, 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 each is very important to understand. Or virtual reality is the is the picture you see over there. That's somebody using a device from uh, Facebook called Oculus, uh, and and that's that's an occluded, fully immersive experience. So there's something in front of your eyes, completely obscuring your view, occluding your view, and you're completely immersed in a in a virtual world. Hence the term virtual reality. Uh, obviously, you cannot walk around with this device. You must be sitting or standing relatively still. Um, and it's it's limited in terms of uh, you know uh, the ability to interact with the environment, uh, in terms of being able to actually see your environment. And then there's augmented reality, and what that is is really the idea of having a see-through device, like a pair of glasses, as I'm wearing right now, and augmenting into your field of view and super positioning or superimposing in your field of view some very simple digital content. It could be text, it could be weather, it could be directions, uh, but it's really symbology, graphics, overlay, kind of a content, simple two-dimensional content. And that's, uh, so when you put simple digital content on a physical world, so you can coexist both worlds, you can see the real world and you can see some virtual images as well. That's augmented reality. And mixed reality is what they call the holy grail. And the example below is uh, the picture of a, a, a person using Microsoft HoloLens. And that's where you actually mix and uh, and fully merge a physical world and virtual world in which you can place virtual objects in the in the physical space and render it so perfectly and register it so that you cannot tell what's real and what's digital. And for example, in surgery, you can go ahead and uh, put some very accurate information to help the surgeon to uh, to assist surgery. And you can actually show organs, you can show overlay of MRIs, or other images that look realistic. So that's mixed reality, and that's the ultimate holy grail, is to completely have your immersive environment and the real environment and to merge everything together. Okay, and here's some examples of what you can find today in the marketplace in terms of these devices. At the upper left-hand side is a woman wearing the Microsoft HoloLens, which is a mixed reality device. On the upper right-hand side, uh, this gentleman over there is wearing a, a, a headset from a company called Magic Leap out of the U.S., which is similar to the Microsoft HoloLens in that it gives you a fully mixed merged reality world. In the bottom right-hand side, 
uh, is, a, is, a, is an example of AR, and that is a gentleman uh, wearing a, a Google Glass. So I think it's the Google Glass 2 right now. And then on the bottom left-hand side, uh, it's a lady wearing a, what's uh, an AR device, and that's uh, a Focals by North, the U.S. company, which is recently acquired by Google. So those are examples of, uh, of MR on top and uh, AR on the bottom in terms of actual real-world uh, devices and products. Okay, let's go into more detail now. High level stuff. So going into a little bit more detail, what are the requirements to develop these such glasses or such headsets so that the expectation is, is that you want to be head up, you want to have your hands free, and you want to wear these things all day. Okay. If the thing is cumbersome, if the device is heavy, if it gets very hot, uh, if it doesn't have uh, enough, uh, enough, uh, enough power, enough uh, battery charge, then it's not useful anymore. And so it has to be very unobtrusive, natural, like wearing a pair of glasses. It has to be that easy. Uh, and that's the expectation. And so in order to do that, it requires some very specific options from an overall uh, uh, device characteristic perspective. Uh, ideally, you want to have indoor and outdoor use. That means that your peak brightness that you want to achieve should be greater than 4,000 candelas per square meter. Uh, typically, sunlight in a bright sunny day is 10 to 15,000 uh, candelas per square meter. And so if you do not have enough brightness, you won't have enough ambient contrast. You won't be able to actually see your, your digital or virtual image in, in your physical space. Important to have very high peak brightness. Certainly, it has a very small form factor. You cannot have too much weight on your on the bridge of your nose. So it has to be less than 80 grams. If it's too heavy, you'll start to get a headache. You'll start to put too much pressure on your nose. So it has to be small. It has to be lightweight, less than 80 grams. It has to be less than one watt total power. That's both your display power as well as processing and any other sensors you may have. You have to have very low latency. By that, I mean the motion to photon latency. If I turn my head like this and I have a fully immersive of field of view and I put a lot of detailed objects there, that object must track my head instantaneously. If there's a motion lag and the latency between the motion of your head and the photon that's displayed, uh, then you'll get very sick. And so it's a big problem. So you have to be less than four milliseconds, ideally, to, to have a, a very minimal motion to photon latency or lag. The field of view is very important. The field of view is a diagonal field of view. So for augmented reality, where you're looking at um, simple graphics and text, uh, you don't want to have a very big field of view because you're looking at information, looking at maybe directions, you're looking at maybe instructions, you're looking at maybe uh, uh, maps and those kind of things. And so you want to be a little bit uh, around your foveal region of, uh, of vision. And so 30 to 40 degree maximum is where you want to be for your for your field of view. Your foveal area is about 15 degrees typically. And so that's where you want to be for your field of view for augmented reality. However, for mixed reality, where I'm having all kinds of objects that are registered to my physical space and have lots of detail rendering, you want to have a very broad field of view. You want to be over 80 degrees field of view so that you can really place objects uh, in a very seamless way. For resolution, uh, again, it depends. For augmented reality, you want to be around a uh, typical HD resolution, which is 720 lines uh, of horizontal resolution. How for mixed reality, you want to have very high resolution. You want to have very high details since you'll be doing holographic rendering. So you want to be over 1400 uh, lines of resolution at least, even, even higher than that. And, and, and equally importantly is how we behave, how we interact with the device. You have to be able to sense and track. You have to have dynamic voice, uh, dynamic sound with very high dynamic range, as well as uh, sound and space localization. So those are the key characteristics that, that, that are necessary uh, in order to be able to achieve a device that people can use uh, all the time. So some examples. So I call this an anatomy of uh, actually MR. I say AR, but I really mean MR. Uh, so this is a Microsoft HoloLens device. This thing has a lot of technology and a lot of years of development to it. It's a simple device from the outside for the average user. But as you can see from the upper left-hand side and going in clockwise fashion, 
uh, you have uh, very complicated waveguides. They use what's called a diffractive waveguide, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, give you a see-through, uh, see-through waveguide. It has uh, two 16 by nine uh, optical light engines. Um, it has uh, a number of uh, what's called IMU uh, uh, inertial measurement unit, a gyroscope, and time about an accelerometer for head tracking and head positioning. Uh, and then on the upper uh, right hand side, you have a number of image sensors. You have depth cameras uh, for for uh, for using time of flight. Uh, you also have cameras for hand tracking. Uh, cameras to do surface reconstruction and object positioning registration. You also have uh, grayscale cameras to get a good understanding of the environment. So you can map out your environment and create maps of your environment. You also have ambient light sensors to be able to moderate and modulate the overall brightness. You also have just regular cameras to capture images. So a lot of uh, optical elements that need to be not only um, a place, but also merged and processed in real time. And do all the processing in the upper on the bottom left side, you've got a lot of memory. You have a very sophisticated uh, uh, CPU and GPUs, uh, lots of memories, as I mentioned, uh, and um, and and of course, you need to have battery uh, that can sustain all the processing, all the display. And so, and so in, in my box and below, what I what I want to talk about is that in order to have interactivity. Uh, it, it means to be able to work with the device in order to have realism, so it looks real, it doesn't look like you know, and in, and to have fully registered objects, uh, registering virtual objects in physical space with high fidelity, high accuracy, and you have to do all that in real time requires very complicated optics, very sophisticated displays, a number of sensors, and to have to take all that all form factor. It's quite challenging, by the way, and that's what all the industry is spending billions of dollars on. And the research institutes, are, uh, research in, uh, in corporations, uh, ongoing to to enable this. Okay, so what is the challenge in? Simply put, the challenge is to take the device on the left hand side, the mixed reality device, the Microsoft HoloLens or the Magic Leap, and merge all that into a pair of glasses. And that is extremely difficult, and that's what everyone's working towards now. And and so, to first order, how you get there, or or the or is a display technology that is the biggest challenge. So to have a very uh, compact near to eye display, and to have very highly efficient, to what's called the combined optics technology, and to bring it all together is is, is what uh, main challenge is, and what I want to talk about uh, today here. For the remainder of this uh, of this talk. Okay, so the way to get there, there are many ways to get there, uh, but uh, we believe the the way to get there today anyway is to use what so called laser beam scanning for near to eye displays. So let me talk about laser beam scanning and what that means. So what is laser beam scanning? And I'll go into more detail over the next few slides. But it's basically a very ultra small micro display. That's basically using what's called a MEMS micro mirror. MEMS, as you know, as you know very well, stands for MEM, uh, mi um, micro electromechanical systems. So using a MEMS micro mirror uh, for laser beam scanning is really important. Um, and uh, and to do that, it also requires a very compact illumination source, um, and that means uh, having very advanced laser diode, um, advanced laser diode modules. Then you have to be able to deliver very high brightness from these modules. Uh, typically, you want to have 10 to the 6 candles per square meter. That's coming out of the module, not to your eye. That'll burn your eye. But out of the module, you need to have very high brightness because you have a lot of losses uh, through the various optical elements that you need to consider. Uh, you have to be low power. Ideally, you want to be less than 500 watts total, which these devices can, can generate. And to you from the from from the uh, from the optical point of view, from the guide optical point of view, uh, you we need to have really very thin, lightweight lenses. So typically, what people are migrating towards is either diffractive or holographic optical element. I'll talk about that also in a little bit more detail um, in the subsequent slides. So in the bottom part of the uh, of the um, of the presentation, uh, you will see a number of things. On the bottom left hand side, let me see if you can see my cursor. If you see my cursor. On the bottom left hand side, uh, as you see the screen, uh, you will see a MEMS die. 
uh, it's a, that's a, that's a small mirror. So in the mirror, in there is a very small mirror uh, that's mirror flexure on both sides to give you uh, what's called a two-dimensional uh, biaxial scan. Um, you can see how small the die is relative to a U.S. Uh, one-cent coin. Um, this die then goes to this package. Uh, this happens to be, in this case, uh, electromagnetic actuated uh, mirror. Uh, so it's biaxial, um, uh, bi biaxial uh, resonant, um, split resonant mirror um, that's magnetically coupled. And you can see the package over here size relative to this U.S. one-cent coin. And then this assembly goes into a larger package with the laser oops, with the laser module, excuse me, and this entire what's called optical light engine, which has the laser module in it. So again, if you can see my cursor, this portion here with this flexure assembly has the laser three laser diodes RGB, and over here with the exit window has the MEMS uh, micro mirror scanner. This optical light engine is as uh, uh, as small as a US 25 cent coin. So that's what it looks like today, even smaller. That's just a uh, uh, state of the art as of uh, last year, two years ago. How it works is very simple. You have a, what's called a MEMS mirror, uh, either a, a 1 2D mirror or two 1D mirrors. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So you have blue laser diode, green laser diode, red laser diode. They go through a beam shaping or columning lens, so collimate the diverging beams coming out of the lasers. They go into what's called dichroic element or simple beam splitters. The beam splitters will take each of the three different beams coming in from different angles and combine them into one collinear collimated beam. That collinear collimated beam will then hit the mirror. The mirror scans in real time, and the scanning is what gives this Rasha scanning is what will paint the picture for you. So it's a pixel by pixel modulation that'll scan for you entire image to your eye or to a display. So that's the principles of a laser beam scanner. So what are the benefits of laser beam scanning? Uh, there are several fold, uh, and I'll go through some of these in some detail. Uh, what, what, what's really important is that what's called low below blur. When you look at an LCD panel, other what's called a fixed pixel display, because the amount of time it takes to switch a pixel on and a pixel off, we'll have what's called a motion blur. So very fast moving objects across the field of you know, on, a, on, a, on a video frame will give you what's called motion blur. And so, uh, and so what you get from a, a, a laser beam scanner is very low persistency and very low blur. Uh, it's typically 10 nanosecond persistency per pixel. And that is a full order of magnitude less than milliseconds required for a typical what's called a fixed pixel display, like an LCD or a DLP, if you know what that is. It has, it has low latency, which is important, which means that you don't get motion sickness uh, because we get low latency because it's so one pixel at a time is rendered um, rather than an entire frame rendering at one given time. Uh, it's very high brightness, which I mentioned earlier is very, very important. Gives you transparent lenses. It also gives you enough margin uh, for losses in your, in your optical uh, in your in your optical stack. Uh, it's very power efficient uh, by laser beam scanning. It's a per pixel modulation. What that means is that the laser power is modulated on a pixel value. So pixel is zero. It's a dark or it's very low grayscale. You reduce the power. You turn the laser off. When there's data there, you turn the laser on. And so by doing dynamic pixel modulation, you have a much lower, uh, uh, lower operating power. A fixed pixel technology like a LCD, like a DLP, has a constant backlight, a constant illumination source. So the light source is illuminated, is constant, and you modulate the pixels to vary the brightness or the contrast. And so it's a lot more power being consumed over there. A laser beam scanning also allows you to scale the uh, field of view uh, within within reason with the same architecture. Uh, today, it's just a degree diagonal. We have shown over a degree uh, field of view in the lab. Uh, with the fixed pixel, uh, when you want to increase the field of view, in the, uh, you cannot scale it as easily. Uh, same thing also for resolution as well. And so also the benefits of, uh, of, of, of laser beam scanning. I'm going pretty quickly. I'm sure I'll have some questions, so please ask questions towards the end. Uh, we could talk about this well that one topic <laughs> for at least uh, what, several hours. So here's an example of uh, of uh, have a pair of glasses today that you can that you can that, that you can uh, get in the marketplace. 
Uh, it, it is not owned by Google. And so you can basically see the size of the glasses, the kind of text. So in this image over here, this is a monocular uh, full color image. So where my cursor is in the right hand side of the temple uh, arm of the glasses is where the uh, scanning engine is. This uses a laser beam scanned a light engine. The image is uh, per projected here. This is uh, what they're using over here is a simple holographic mirror combiner. So, and then uh, it's a fully transparent lens uh, and uh, a very, very common device. Okay. <clears throat> now, how do you achieve that? What is the technology behind a laser beam scanning? So what uh, the technology is, as I mentioned earlier, is a MEMS micro mirror, micro electromechanical scanning, what MEMS stands for. It's micro electromechanical mirror. And and it's called actuation. So you're actuating, right? You're converting from one form of energy to another form of energy. And so in this case, you know, we are we are we are we are we are, we are driving uh, a, a MEMS device to steer a light, essentially. Uh, there are three different ways to do the kind of steering or this kind of uh, scanning. There's electrostatic, there's electromagnetic, and there's piezoelectric. Those are the three. Uh, as, as a company, we do all three. Uh, we started with electrostatic. We still still have that. We then went to electromagnetic, and uh, for the future, future for the future generations, we go to piezoelectric, and I'll talk about why piezoelectric is important. Uh, electrostatic is uh, yeah, uses basically you can see the picture over here. It's used a comb finger drive. It's capacitively coupled, capacitively driven. And because it's a comb finger drive, when you want to have a greater and greater field of view, a larger mechanical opening angle, they call it, you have to have higher voltages, higher capacitances, therefore a larger uh, larger area for your comb finger drive structure. Then it, that means uh, the die gets bigger, the chip gets bigger. When, when you have too much area for your comb, that causes problems in a manufacturing point of view in that you can have particles that deposit in your comb structure with into into interstitial region where your comb is that can cause shorting other problems as well. So you want to be careful on how big you can make it. So electrostatic is very good technology um, and we have very good, very good results with it, but it's limited in terms of how you can scale it for your field of view, how you can scale it for your resolution. Then we'll go to electromagnetic. Electromagnetic over here is a picture of the device. It's a biaxial uh, uh, split resonant linear device. It's resonant in one domain and linear in another domain, and it's a single axis and it's torquing on two different axes over here. You can barely see in the picture over here hinges that can that can that can uh, that, that that can twist it in two different directions. Uh, it's a very good technology. It has very good opening angles. Um, the uh, the issue with electromagnetic is, of course, it's magnet, and so depending on application, it can interference of a magnet to other electronics. It's also very th it's much thicker, uh, and it's because current driven. Uh, it's a J cross B, right, to get magnetic field, uh, and so because it's because it's magnetically driven, uh, 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 magnetically electromagnetically driven, it's 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 current driven, so it consumes a lot more power. Uh, but it's also very good technology, but it has certain limitations. And so where we're going in the future, where you already are today, is what's uh, using what's called PZT. Uh, PZT, for those of you, those of you who don't know, uh, stands for lead zirconium titanate. It is the piece of material, the main materials. PZT is one of them. And so PZT is the ideal uh, because it has a very good uh, 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 force density uh, required, reasonably, reasonably low power and very high scalability. Uh, so that's where we're going towards the future. But nevertheless, those are the three different techniques which you can use to go uh, uh, take these mirrors and to, to, to twist and turn and to scan them. Okay, a little more detail. So, oops. And so, as, as I said earlier, uh, as I said earlier, uh, PZT uh, uh, is, is very good for your applications. It's very good because uh, here's a rendering of what the device looks like. Um, uh, it has uh, it enables very high resolution, uh, 1080p to 1440 and higher. Uh, what you see over here is a typical structure. It's a paddle structure. Uh, these squares over here are your are your bond wires. They connect to the actuation. These green areas are your piezo areas. That's what's actuated on both sides. So it's a push pull thing. 
as you know, uh, PSO properties that when you have a voltage, you'll cause mass to move, right? Or if we, when you when you squeeze or expand mass, create a voltage. That's of course a uh, piezoelectric property. And so in this case over here, apply a voltage, you create mass to move. And these paddles over here represent your piezo area, and that'll push and pull your 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 device here to twist and turn the mirror in one axis. So the so this is a very high resolution device. The field of view is very broad. It's very low power consumption because it's capacitively driven, as opposed to uh, uh, sorry, it's uh, yeah, it's voltage driven, but it has a capacitive load. And uh, later on, I'll talk about how you can get much lower 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 uh, lower power power drive. It's very small from an overall footprint point of view. Uh, and then over here, you can see this device action. If you'll if I can run my video here, you'll see what it looks like over here. So in the lab over here, you can look at how the mirror is actuated and how it uh, deflects back and forth. So that's at a very high level what what a piece uh, what our PCT technology looks like and uh, some of the advantages of it. And I apologize for the speed of the presentation, but uh, please ask questions later. So a little bit more detail in, in in sort of real life. This is what it looks like over here. So you've got basically your your PCT material. You've got your contacts on top, contacts on bottom for, for your drive. You have a membrane, which the PCT then flexes and moves back and forth. And you have a hinge over here. And and so below, you'll see a picture of this of this membrane being deflected up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, that that's being uh, driven by a PCT material. So this is what it looks like in the lab, and this is what it looks like as a schematic for a diagram. And over here is an SEM of what it looks like. You can look at the top electrode, the PCT material deposited, the bottom electrode, the isolating oxide. This is a, this is a slight. Oh, this is a cross section of view. Here's a top view, basically of what it looks like. And then out here is your is your is your flexure, and then your membranes. Okay. So this is uh, what uh, what uh, what uh, what the PCT implementation is at least uh, in, in our production line, and how PCT works. Okay. So uh, I mentioned earlier it's very low power. It's very low power because uh, you know we we have a technology called the BCD, which is bipolar CMOS double diffuse MOS. Uh, and uh, and and so the way this works is that you know this is a voltage-driven uh, device, but it's capacit uh, the capacitors to store the charges and to deliver the charges as well. And so as you go through uh, various cycles, you never end up uh, discharging or charging completely, uh, depending uh, depending on cycle of operation. And so the excess charge, rather than bleeding into ground, we store it in what's called tank capacitors, and we can reuse the charge. And by reusing the charge in, in, in tank capacitors, uh, we can then uh, we can then significantly reduce how much power is required for the system. And so what we found in our labs and now in our production is we can reduce power by a factor of six. So power consumption for a resident system, uh, power consumption for a resident system is uh, is uh, uh, given by CV squared F. Uh, where F is a frequency operation, and what we have found here is we can reduce the power by a factor of six um, uh, by using our 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 drive scheme. And this is important because by having much lower power operation, you can either increase your voltage. That means uh, you can increase you can increase the field of view, your opening angle. But because of the one one over six factor, you can have a lower power consumption. And yet a higher field of view by increasing your voltage, or you have a, you keep, keep a field of view fixed, but have a higher frequency operation, and that means you go to high resolution. So it allows you to scale it and and control your power. So that's how you drive these things. That's how um, that's how uh, 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 you know you can benefit. Okay, I want to go into optic side now over here as well. Um, so. <clears throat> What is a key challenge? So one of the key challenges that's that's not really talked about, and it's really hard to understand, but I think you guys are all you know very smart, you know it. The key challenge is trying to have a good field of view and a good eye box. So what is the eye box? The eye box is the uh, you know the uh, how much of the image is filling your pupil from your environment. So the simplest way to think about an eye box is that if you if you put your eye 
and you go into a small keyhole, like in a door, if you're trying to go through, look into somebody's room and then to go to a small peeping keyhole, you will notice that as your eye moves around, you'll lose the image. It's called vignetting. And that is an example of what eye box looks like. So the narrower, narrower is your, your, your entrance pupil, the image that you see is coming, coming in a very sharp angles. And if you, if you move your eye, you'll lose the image. Important to have a very large eye box. So as your eye moves and your pupil rotates naturally, you don't lose the image. You don't have a, what's called vignetting. And so that's been a real issue for, for waveguides uh, in, in order to have a large eye box with a good field of view. And the reason why it's very simple, it's just, it's just, it's conservation. It's what's called a Lagrangian variant or a tendu. So simply put, when you have an object domain, if we, so H1 over here represents an aperture. It could be a MEMS mirror. It could be a, a LCD device. It's a, it could be an emitter of some kind. It's basically your object, object, object field. And there is a certain field of view and a certain, uh, and a certain aperture size. And then you have some collecting optics over here, your lens optics imaging optics, collection optics, and that imaging optics or the collection optics then goes and delivers that image to your image domain. An image domain has a certain aperture, uh, aperture size, if you will, and an acceptance angle. So you've got, uh, you've got your input size, you have a transfer function, you have your output size. And the rule of thumb basically is given by this formula over here, basically, the aperture size times the, times the field of view from the input domain has to be the same product on the output domain. And so in this case, typically, for example, uh, a MEMS mirror is in the order of one millimeter aperture size. The typical scan angle on the horizontal domain is around 48 degrees on a horizontal scan, 40 degrees in the diagonal. Um, so if you do the math, you get uh, 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 an eye box size of 1.4 millimeter on the uh, on the horizontal domain. That's too small. Why does this matter? This matters because we are developing optics for the eye, and people are wearing a gl eyeglasses. People, what's called the interpupillary distance, the distance between the pupils varies depending upon what race you are, depending upon age, uh, depending upon head sizes, depending upon gender. And so, because the interpupillary distance varies, your eye box size uh, will also vary. And therefore, you have to design an optical system with a large enough eye box to cover most of the people's uh, natural interpupillary distance of, of human uh, variation across gender, across age, across ethnicities. And so, generally speaking, if you have a, a, a eye box size, of about 10 millimeters or larger, then that'll cover about 90% of people for their variation of interpupillary distance. And that's just the, so the data from the last uh, 50, 100 years. So in order to do that, you have to then do what's called a pupil expansion or an eye box expansion. So in the bottom are two different schemes that can, that can you be used for your for your what's called combining optic to bring the light from the display to your eye. There's one it's called uh, uh, transdeflective mirrors. I'll talk about it in a second. And there's one that's using a diffractive optical waveguide. So transdeflective mirrors do what that's what that's what what what's one what's called one D pupil expansion, and then uh, the diffraction type of optics has two D eye box pupil expansion. But you have to expand the eye box. You have to expand this pupil so that you can have a large enough eye box in order to be able to have very comfortable viewing for most people. It's a lot of data here. I'm lot of lot, lot, I'm covering quite a bit, so I'm sure there'll be questions. So, um, but this, 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 keep this in mind. It's a very important point. All right, let's talk about waveguides. There, are, there are typically two kinds of key waveguides that are used today for for AR. Uh, that is that is diffractive versus reflective. In the upper on the upper side, there's two kinds of uh, of a diffractive uh, optical waveguide. Uh, well, one uses uh, holographic uh, elements, another uses uh, uh, physical elements. What's called a surface relief element. Uh, whichever ones you use, you basically you take incoming light, you diffract the light 
into the waveguide. You have a very high index material that'll guide the waveguide, and then you'll hit another uh, diffractive surface that'll outcouple the light to your eye. So that's a simple principle. So you can see over here, right? Uh, for example, on the surface relief, you uh, you know you couple in light, you chat, you, you launch it, you diffract it into your waveguide. Waveguide guides it through with some loss, but it's pretty good. You know, if, if you have a pretty high index, you can you, know, you can pretty much uh, capture most of it. You'll hit the you'll hit the outcoupler and then go into your eye. For the for the uh, 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 reflective type, there are two kinds. Uh, there's what a trans reflective. Uh, or, or, it's called, or, or it's called a cascaded beam splitter. You over here, you have a series of mirrors, uh, partially reflecting mirrors, you know, that are embedded, uh, you know, in a in your in your lens flow, and then they so each mirror will reflect uh, partially most light to your eye and combine it, and then there is fully reflective. This goes in a surface. Uh, the the freeform surface will take your uh, take your light and then guide it completely and then bring it to your eye. And so I'll talk about what the advantages and benefits are for each of them. So those are the typical ways things are done today for AR. And then uh, the in terms of an optical, actual applications, the diffractive guide, you can see over here, typical uh, diffractive optical element lens. Uh, over here on, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the arrow pointing to your input grading that'll launch it into your pupil expansion layer, and in there, there's an outcoupler, which can then launch the light back into your eye. And then for the reflective type, you can see a picture over here of uh, what that looks like. There's the input prism that caps all the light uh, from the imager device, and then and then launch it into your waveguide, where you have a series of uh, partial reflectors, then they'll then reflect that light back into your eye. So those are two real world Examples of, uh, of 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 those kind of waveguides, and then there's non-guided wave optics, and uh, and that's really a there's two kinds over here. One's called birdbath optics, uh, which is very large, but it works very well. So you've got a simple parabolic or other kind of combiner uh, that's uh, partially transmitting, partially reflecting, um, uh, depending on architecture, uh, or there'll be a channel mirror that's partially reflecting or partially transparent. Uh, and then that'll guide, uh, non-guide, it'll reflect back the, the image to your eye. And then there's a holographic combiner, like I showed you earlier, the glasses, which uses a very simple hologram, holographic element as, as a mirror, as a, part, as a partially reflecting mirror. So those are the, those are the different types of uh, uh, non-guided optics that you can use for, uh, for your lenses. So if you put it all together from a qualitative perspective, these are some of the advantages and disadvantages of the various waveguides. I won't, <clears throat> I won't go through each one. You can read it. You can read it for yourself. You have the recordings. But basically, um, you know, we look at different aspects. Look, look at the efficiency, which means how much light is being lost in the system. How big is it? How heavy is it? What kind of uniformity do you get for brightness? Very important. What kind of uniformity do you have for color? What kind of a view uh, does the system uh, uh, generate? Uh, what's your eye box size? Uh, can you uh, can you have persistent glasses with it or not? Uh, how easy is it to make, and how mature is it? So those are some of the um, you know the various dimensions that, that you look at in terms of assessing uh, different kinds of waveguides. And as you can see, and as you can well imagine, uh, each one has its own benefits. Each one has has, has own uh, uh, demerits. So depending on your certain interests and certain um, uh, what what's of value to uh, for a given system, it will then lead you to choose what you want to choose. Generally speaking, though, I will tell you, bird bath optics is not good. It's very big. It's very heavy. It's very bulky. So people generally don't use bird bath optics. Holographic is the future. We think uh, they think. Uh, because it's very simple, you once you do a recording of your hologram, uh, as you know very well, you can record any kind of optical property in theory into 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 a hologram. The question then becomes: is uh, uh, how good is hologram in terms of recording? How good is the reproduction of it? Uh, what are the various uh, uh, artifacts they get from it? It's still a very long way, but that's sort of the future. Uh, and and so what people are really going towards uh, today is really a diffractive waveguide. And all the, a lot of the companies are really investing more and more into that right now. That seems, that seems to show the greatest promise. 
Uh, reflecting on the other hand is very simple. It's uh, readily available today uh, from a manufacturing point of view. It's 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 you know it's straightforward. So, the reflective and the diffractive is typically what people are are, are going for today in terms of practical, but of course R and D point of view, uh, quite a bit of work is going to holographic. <clears throat> okay, so what does the system look like? Uh, this is a little simple picture. Uh, of a reflector or a diffractive, both of them still have the same uh, principles. Uh, you have a you have a basic uh, three key elements. You need to have ultra small uh, MEMS mirrors. You need to have a very compact uh, lazy diode driver in a single package, and you have to have very compact optical uh, design and systems. So, so basically, the key things are is a lazy diode module, right? Today, uh, you know, courtesy of uh, Osram, it's a very uh, large. Uh, Lazy, lazy manufacturer out of Germany. Uh, they have very small modules. They took a what's the best in class uh, up, up until now uh, device, which is 280 millimeter cubic uh, in terms of volume. That uses what's called a TO38 can, the very simple lit, uh, lit can, lidded, uh, encapsulated, uh, single element uh, RGB diode. And they combine all that into a single uh, module over here in the surface mounted module. So you'll take your three edge emitting diodes, place them on a module and package them and get them much smaller. And you can see over here, it's extremely small. And then you have a uh, very good compact, uh, uh, you know, guiding optics. Uh, then you have uh, the MEM scanners, which is very, very small. MEM scanners are of one uh, to 1 1.5 millimeters uh, in diameter. And you go through uh, some very compact really optics and into your end couple guide. The difference between a one uh, between a reflective and a diffractive is that uh, a reflective does 1D expansion, so you have to have expansion on the other dimension. So you have to put in some kind of elements to do the people expansion. Whereas in a in a uh, a diffractive waveguide, you do 2D people expansion directly in the uh, waveguide itself. So that's really architecturally what the simplistically what it looks like. It's more complicated, obviously, as you actually build these things. That gives you an idea, it gives you a flavor. So let me give you some demonstrations. So this is all just talk. We've actually achieved some very good results. So taking the our electrostatic micromirrors chipsets uh, with a with a 30 degree down the view at a four by three aspect ratio, at a 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter eye box and monocular. Using a single layer diffractive waveguide, you can see on the left hand side uh, a, a demonstration we uh, we we showed last we we're going to show last year at the Mobile World Congress. So on the top side is the you know uh, demonstration of what uh, what the glass you know what the glasses look like, and then in the bottom you can see three different images uh, taken through a cell phone camera of what the image looks like as you see through it with your eye. So it's, it's fairly good. I mean, there's a lot lot you know, lot 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 of work that needs to be done. But uh, we were able to very quickly demonstrate and show uh, this kind of very highly efficient coupling. You'll notice that the sunglasses here are tilted, and as the eyeglasses are tinted. It's tinted because the efficiency is still not there yet. We're still working on improving efficiency. Uh, you have to have high brightness uh, to, in order to have high ambient contrast ratio. Or conversely, if you don't have high brightness, you have to have tinted glasses to reject a lot of the ambient light. So that's why you do what that's what we're doing over here. Nonetheless, we had very good and very uh, successful results. I cannot share with you what we're doing today, but we've gotten much better, much smaller, much lighter, much brighter. So that's where we are today from the state of the art. So the pathway to reduce total volume. So the demonstration I just showed you in the top is what, what uh, I just showed you. Below is what we want to get to from a form factor perspective. And so the above, this guy over here used a TO38 can that I showed you in an earlier picture. This one down here will use a, 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 single, a single laser diode uh, module. The, the uh, optimal mechanical design is much more compact down here than up there because of the smaller lasers. Uh, there will also be a very ultra compact really optic design as well. But it's not just the optics. You also have to have very compact electronic design, the PCB design, to use so what's called you know a multi-layer, uh, 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 two-dimensional design of the PCB. You have device on the front end and the back side, so you can have much more compact design. Uh, but you also have to take all these designs and ensure you have manufacturing tolerances. So you do DFM. 
So whenever you're doing research, whenever you're doing design, you have to then say, hey, what can I achieve? What can I do? What's the best I could do? But you have to make sure the best you can do can also tolerate the variations you get in the manufacturing line, in manufacturing operations, in device operations. So we have to have, take all those things into account uh, whenever you whenever you go ahead and, uh, and and design products and design technologies. So that's sort of a, you know so that's sort of where we are today and where we're going. Finally, I think in my last slide. So what do you conclude? So what does all this mean? I, I have given you a lot of data. Uh, probably more than you more than you more than you care to see. What what all this means is that at the end, like anything else, it's all about trade-offs. And so I show you a very simple radar or what's called a spider web diagram, right? This is an example, there's not real data, this is an example, but there are multi-dimensions that you have to you have to optimize around. You have to optimize around size, power, field of view, weight, resolution, brightness. And all these things coexist. If you pull one, you pull the other, right? They're all functions of each other. So they're all coupled. So you can decouple them differentially, like you, like you do it, like you, like you, like you do it differential equations. But once you, once you start to get non-differential, then you gotta make trade-offs. It's so you have to, you cannot simultaneously achieve high brightness, high resolution, large field of view, large eye box, lightweight, low power. You cannot, you cannot achieve simultaneously. These guys are tightly coupled, right? So therefore, you got to say, okay, then what do I do? You have to optimize for what you intend to use it. Generally speaking, you want to say, look, how much of the field of view do I want? And how bright do I want it to be? And what kind of resolution do I want? And that'll help then guide you towards other parameters. So if you're doing simple text, doing simple graphics, then it's one set of answers. You want to get fully immersive, it's a different set of answers. So you have to help that guide your decisions on your optimization of your performance. So lazy beam scanning, at least, uh, does an important fact in that they can help minimize your decision making. We helped with the power equation, we helped with the weight equation, we helped with the field of view, resolution, and brightness equation. We can help with all that in terms of giving much more degrees of freedom. So then you can design, uh, have less constraints coming from that perspective, and then have uh, you know more uh, parameters that you can optimize aside from that. That's where lazy beam scanning is important because it's small, because it's low power, because it has very good field of view, because it's scale resolution. It, it, it gives you a greater degrees of freedom. It doesn't decouple entirely, those parameters, but it gives you relaxation on those parameters. So it's not a first order effect. It can be a third or fourth order effect. That's where it becomes helpful. And that's that's what it is. But the other thing I want I want to share with the people on this on this phone, especially uh, people studying your PhDs or, or postdocs, the thing you have to think about is that whenever you're doing your analysis, you have to think about the system. I can tell you the biggest weakness that I see of, of people coming out of universities today and going to work for companies, and I find it really frustrating, is that they're very, very good in a very narrow area, but you have to understand the systems. How does a system behave? What does a system engineering looks like? That is really hard. And a system means I got, I got to think of mechanical issues, thermal issues, how to think of optical issues, how to think about processing issues. You have to look at the system consideration because everything actually today, in today's world, in today's devices, uh, it's always been true, but it's even more true now where you have to have a systems point of view uh, in all of this. Because if you don't do that, then you end up putting the burden on somebody else to some other part of the system to solve the problem. And my last slide is that, okay, a glimpse of the future. It's the far, far future. It's a company called Motri, who is developing contact lenses. So this is, you know, uh, the uh, if you've seen a movie called, what's that called? I think it's called uh, Minority Report with Tom Cruise. I mean, it was a long time ago. It's a future where you can see things in space. You have, you have contact lenses uh, or embedded, embedded implants in your eye, and everything comes in front of you. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's a good world or a bad world, but that's already been developed now. The far, far future, 10, 15, 20 years away, we have embedded devices where now there's no glasses. You see everything. So that's where we're going, for better or worse. So with that, uh, I want to thank you. I hope I didn't take too much time. I think it took about a for that. Uh, but I just wanted to you know, spend time chatting with you and giving you a perspective 
on, um, on, 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 on all the areas that I can in the one hour for AR. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a very insightful talk. Uh, during this lockdown, uh, COVID lockdown uh, period, few primary teachers use AR technology to educate the school children. So indeed, this AR technology has a future. Uh, thank you, sir, for this talk. Now I request Palak to kindly take the question answer session. There. Push. Abradeep, he is asking that uh, what are, uh, are these devices easily connectable with gadgets like? Uh, I'm sorry, pa Palak, you broke up and there's a lot of noise in the back. I'm sorry, there's quite a bit of noise in the uh, background. The question I heard is, are the devices discuss... easily connectable yes. with gadgets like TV? No. So, ah. the answer is no, not today. Uh, no. Yeah. That's a, that, that, no, not a... Yes, very good. Please continue. Hello? Uh, these devices easily connect. Android phones synchronously? Okay, so the short answer is not directly. However, the longer answer is, is that the goal is to connect these guys to their cell phones. That's a f and so some of these devices are uh, connectable to your to your smartphone. That is true. So the glasses that I showed you, the one that Google, the couple that Google purchased, it's called Focals by North. That connects through the Bluetooth and your cell phone. So the primary goal today is to replicate what you see on your phone over here. And so that is where people are going. In theory, you can connect your computer and some do. And in theory, uh, you can to your TV and, and some don't. But uh, but that is a simple problem. Th that problem is not a very difficult problem to solve. More difficult problem to solve is the optics problem, the power problem, and the uh, overall uh, uh, image quality issue. Okay. What, sir? Am I audible? Long. Time. Sorry, uh, Paula, can you please repeat that question? I'm sorry, you broke up there. Associated with prolonged use of AR, VR, MR devices. Great question. Okay, let's go step by step. Uh, I will tell you that VR has a big concern, twofold. Number one, it's immersive. So you're closed off completely and you're illuminating eye with a lot of bright colors particular lot of blue content and short wavelength content. As you know very well, uh, short of the wavelength, the greater the damage uh, to your eye. Second problem is myopia. Uh, myopia is a big problem. It's, it's true with cell phones, by the way, because a lot of young kids do this all the time and older people now. Uh, what people are finding with a, the, there's, there's been a large longitudinal study of school children in Singapore, and they found out about 70% of the kids in Singapore have myopia. The traditional rate is around 30 to 40 percent. So what ends up happening is, is that there's more and more you focus in a neat field at a young age as your eyes are forming physiologically, the greater the uh, uh, chance for myopia. And the problem with myopia is that over time, your eyes get bigger and bigger to focus. And your eye gets bigger, your, your rate of retinal detachment is much higher at older age. So long-term consequence, of wearing these devices could be that. AR could be okay, that's VR. AR could be okay because if you're focusing in the infinity, you're not focusing here on a physiological point of view. However, what's not understood is the social impacts of that. Uh, the other issues, the concerns are privacy, the concerns are monitoring, the concerns are, you know, 
uh, uh, what are people doing with the data? Uh, are they looking and capturing camera images and security? So it's more of a societal consideration uh, for AR in the long term in terms of how it's used, how it's utilized, what's being captured. So it remains to be seen. Okay, so the next question is from Jyoti. She's asking that what does the maturity of a waveguide signify? Maturity signifies, gets great question. Thank you for that. Maturity signifies that it is manufacturable. Okay. That's all it means. That means that it's that that means you know, that means a waveguide is in a such a state of the material property, materials availability, manufacturing tolerances, and manufacturing yield that you could go into mass production at a reasonable cost, at a reasonable yield, at a reasonable volume in a reasonable time. That's what maturity means. MR gear in IC and surgeries. So Microsoft is doing a lot of work with uh, with physicians and they're using it in real time as an assist device. So for example, uh, to, to look at things like where do they do the incision uh, or projecting in the field of view, uh, the MRI. So it's used in, uh, I would say, in a, in a passive mode, not quite an active mode yet. I think we're still pretty far away uh, by having it used in active mode. Uh, and to do that, of course, we require this in the U.S. and it requires uh, FDA approval and a lot of testing. So I would say we're quite far away uh, from from active use, but the passive use is great. It, sorry, sorry, from a passive point of view, for example, if you go to an ICU today and OR or, or operating room today, the surgeon is operating, is look up to the TV monitor and look down and look up and look down and look up when he's looking at an MRI or X-ray or, or a TV of the image. However, with, uh, with the AR, uh, a lot of surgeons to today are using on a trial basis that they can have the image right there. So they keep their head down and look at, okay, there's an MRI, there's a CT scan, or there's an X-ray, or there's a camera image. So the answer is, it's, 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 it's being used today on a trial basis as a passive device, but as an active device, I think we're pretty far away. Okay. So next question is, what help these technology brings to partial blind population and to color blinds? It's a great question. Now, for color blind is a whole different discussion, right? Uh, Let's go to partial blind. It depends on why people are blind. Uh, typically, if there's no retinal damage, okay, then what you can do is what's called retinal scanning. So rather than uh, having an image in the image plane out here, you can do a direct retinal scan. That means the laser beam can scan the back of your retina. As long as you have corneal damage, it's okay because retina is the most important. And if your retina is intact, then uh, for people who are blind, the studies have been done. I think a study was done in Israel, I believe, with some blue people, uh, particularly those with AMR, uh, it's called age-related macular degeneration. For people like that, it's huge help to be able to read, be able to see the system, huge help. Uh, if you have retinal damage, unfortunately, nothing can be done because you know you cannot receive and receive those photons, right? Uh, it's unfortunately, you're, you cannot transmit those photons to your, to your brain, regrettably. But if retina syntax is fine now, Colorblind is a different discussion. Typically, a colorblind is a deficiency of your, uh, I can't, I can't remember, I think it's, I think it's your rods, rods or cones, I forget now, but one of those things, right? I think either your rods or your cones, whichever is the color receptor, uh, you know, when you have no receptors for color, nothing you can do, right? And so there's not much you can stimulate color because if, if, if those neurons don't exist, if those receptors don't exist to absorb that radiation and to convert that into signal, there's nothing you can do. So colorblind, not much you can do at all. But those who are sight impaired with a good retina, a lot can be done. Okay, now all the questions from the chat are over. So if anyone has any query, he or she can unmute themselves and ask.
Hello. Yeah. Yeah, you are audible. Thank. You. First of all, I would like to thank you, sir, for this enlightening presentation. Uh, one of my again question is that, uh, how is it? Uh, how much is it marketable? I mean, I used to work in AEC Industries, and they used to uh, convert the models, like uh, building information models, BIM models, into the augmented reality form. and they used to design uh, uh, buildings accordingly so that they can coordinate the various trades such as mechanical electrical and plumbing these are the various trades used in aec industries and couple them in the building itself so that they can render the services together and can understand the services uh, how they are like uh, how they are behaving when they are like uh, done in the practical world i mean how much the extent we can go in this uh, very far very far gets great question thank you for the question very good and for those of you on the phone uh, aec is architect architectural engineering construction if you don't know that Absolutely. so and so and so for aec industry it's a huge value how lens is being okay i give you one example uh nvidia if you know is a company that that that, that, that delivers high high performance gpus in the us a very very successful company Uh, they built their headquarters here in Silicon Valley. Their design of the building was done on a VR headset. They put the entire thing, they conceptualized it, and they did the design using it. So it's being used more and more uh, in AEC. Uh, people use the HoloLens for the exact purpose you mentioned, right? You can visualize your conduits, your uh, where you want your electrical wiring to be, your stairs, uh, your plenum, your different structures, right, in your building, for example. So it's used quite a bit. It's used in the automotive industry for automotive repair. And there were repair technicians, for example. Mercedes uses it. BMW uses it. And so it's a wide range of applications. So the first use case is actually in that sector, because that's what that that's where it's used. Having said it, that's why it's really important to have very good rendering, real world registration, right, and and and, yeah. and very high quality processing. Extremely important because if you make a mistake. That's the big problem. So the answer is it's being used quite a bit, actually. Good question. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Bharat, uh, you really gave us a very, very fantastic talk, and uh, you have given a broad perspective, uh, very, very enlightened uh, uh, talk. So, my uh, a small query is like whether. A, can we use this technology for the uh, virtual reality for the head up display uh, for aircraft or maybe some other application like automobiles high speed cars and how effectively it is people are using in the worldwide great question thank you dr tiwari a uh, very good question so uh, let me start the history in fact this technology came from the aircraft industry it came from the military and aircraft so boeing many many years ago started doing each uh, let me step back hair display has been on for a long time so uh, as you know very well in fighter aircraft and commercial aircraft uh, uh without on the windshield itself you can see images right, right? it's called as you know very well that's called uh, so they project onto the windshield right if you all the spread the plane shield uh, h2d and they went to face shields military pilots have you know the mig fighters the, you know right as well as the us based fighters right they all is uh you know hmd and the helmets yes, that's, yes, that's yes. where it came from that's where it came from you know very well so that that's the origin so it came from military and the commercial aviation and then now into automotive in cars already have today hmd not the glasses version but uh, mounted in their dashboards so the advanced uh, cars from bmw audi and those guys already have hmd in their car Right. now that's going to that's going to keep going right there are some problems with it because the difficulty of putting into a car and embedding it is up above and beyond the harsh environmental conditions right winter summer heating and all these things other problems vibration besides that it's hard to get a big field of view as you know very well from optical point of view larger field of view means larger optics larger optic means a bigger object bigger object means you have to have more space in your dashboard that's a big problem for car companies So using a external head up display unit into a car or, or 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 vehicle becomes very difficult just from a space and a power consideration. However, you wearing glasses in your car and having the same efficient 
is to the future. So to answer your question very shortly and very briefly, for an external mounted unit into an aircraft or a vehicle, that's happening, it's gonna happen, happens today. That'll go on for a number of years. Some point in the future, three years, four years, five years, yeah. we don't know. Some point in the future, this will come and replace that. So what do you see the future, basically? Yeah, what do you see the uh, next uh, generation of this uh, display technology? Boy, so the next generation is going to be, huh, I don't know if I like it personally, but it doesn't matter. This will yeah. be a cell phone. This, this is going to be a cell phone. Today, it went from, it went from this to your watch. It's going here next, okay? It's going here. People are going to be walking around all the time talking because as, uh, today already you have very sensitive directional microphone. You have uh, natural language processing like Alexa and Siri are very, they're quite good. You have, we have uh, very high quality, uh, uh, you know, uh, unoccluded speakers. You have very good processing, very, very good display, very low power. You have multiple batteries. So the future, if this is health, this cell phone, we're all gonna be wearing around seeing everything here. So so people are doing, the, people do this all the time. I'll be doing this all the time. <laughs> that's the future. That, that's where you're headed, uh, like it or not. That's where we're going. That's, 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 that's a future world. From a technology Thank you. point of view, yeah. So, from a technology point of view, it'll be laser beam scanning today. The future, yeah. for the future from a technology, then the next future, where people are going to what's called micro LED, okay, micro LEDs, as you probably heard about. And right. that's a self-emissive device, and they're going to be integrating uh, uh, three LEDs into one single uh, pixel. Called that, right? The future of that, and a far future will be contact lenses. That's another 15, 20 years. So, that's where we're going. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. My name is Vipinder, and uh, uh, my question is: uh, Actually, you indicated two challenges uh, in your presentation. One is compact design. And another is uh, efficient uh, combiner technology. I am curious to know about uh, when we say this, a combiner is efficient. What does what are the cri criteria to indicate? Uh, okay, this combiner is efficient. Great question. Uh, it just simply means that you have very low light loss. So what ends up happening in a combiner is is that um, you know you have different loss loss mechanisms, right? You have uh, reflection, for example. You have absorption losses and scattering losses, right? And so when you inject uh, light beams uh, into a combiner and you diffract it from one angle to another angle, um, then you have, you know, uh, you have many mechanisms on how you lose light through your waveguide. Typically, as you know very well, uh, TIR, a total internal reflection, is not perfect, right? You have, you have what's called evidence and decay. There's always some losses due to that, right? And the other scattering losses, then the then the, you, you don't take all the orders of diffraction. You don't take a certain angle. You have some losses over there as well. Then you expand the beam, you spread the beam out over a large area. You have some losses over there as well. So that's what I mean. You have various loss mechanisms that go through your entire optical stack. That's just the diffraction itself. On the scanner, the scanner also has a certain aperture size. It also has a certain absorption spectrum and a reflection spectrum, right? You have loss, losses there as well. Or your collimator beam. So your collimation, the light hits your collimator, you reflect some, and then you transmit some, you have a certain aperture size. So as you go through your optical stack, it, nothing's perfect. You always have losses in every single element. And that's what I mean by combiner optics, right? You have losses that are really highly efficient combiner optics. For your waveguides, particularly diffractive waveguides, Today, they're not as efficient as reflective. Reflective is very efficient, right? There's a mirror, mirror is controlled, mirror is pretty straightforward, right? You code it more and more and more, right? You better, better aluminum. For optical uh, wavelengths, you do more and more aluminum coating, right? Better quality aluminum can get you good optical coating, uh, coating, right? For example. But as you're going through a diffractive medium and a diffractive grading structure, and then going through some kind of a, uh, uh, some kind of a uh, high index material, a lot of things go wrong, and you have losses there. That's what I mean. 
Thank you for the answer. You're welcome. Anyone have any question? They may unmute themselves. Hello. Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Audible. Yes. I said Dr. R.C. Kalonia. I am ex scientist from CSIO. Dr. Saab, I have joined this lecture in between. Really, it is a wonderful lecture. I want to thank it a lot. Really, I enjoyed this lecture. Thanks. Thank you so much for your comment. I appreciate it. I'm glad you found it useful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, anyone if have any question? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, time. Uh, now I request uh, Amit to kindly uh, give the uh, word of thanks to our uh, speaker. On I mean, your voice is break, uh, breaking and uh, not audible. So I think you switch off your uh, video and then I think I propose a uh, vote of thing. Your voice is uh, uh, breaking. Uh. Hello, sorry for disturbance, sir. On behalf of SPI student chapter, I am Amit Pandey, taking opportunity to thanking our today's evening speaker, Dr. Bharat Rajgopal. Sir, thank you, sir, for such a wonderful talk on laser beam scanning for near eye application. Sir, your talk is very informative from the beginning. You tell that virtual reality, augmented reality, application of optics and photonics for human future things. Thank you for such a wonderful talk. Thank you. Over to Kishu, sir. Thank you, Amit. Uh, now I will, I will request. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, why again uh, this uh, he's continuing speaking like? Uh, uh, so, uh, I guess that that is a he already finished his uh, very before, but uh, yeah, might I be some technical so. problem. Yeah, some delay, some delay or something, some some, some problem is there. So yeah. can, can't you can't you mute, mute like? Um... Yeah, I, I muted him. So yeah. now Thank I you. now I request everyone to kindly uh, switch on their camera so that we can have a digital selfie with our uh, speaker. <laughs> Uh, okay, everyone. Okay.
Now on count of three. One, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So okay. thank you very much, sir. Thanks for sparing your valuable time. Uh, so on, on behalf of SPI chapter, I once again uh, offering my uh, gratitude to you uh, for you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. I really appreciate the great questions. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. Uh, hopefully, you found this of uh, value and interest. And, uh, you know, I wish you all very uh, safe health and safety and, uh, and the best of luck. With your, with your, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I hope we'll get some opportunity to uh, see you again um, in some somewhere. Or maybe if we have some opportunity to call you uh, physically to the CSIU. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be delighted. It'll be a pleasure. Hope to see all of you soon. And yeah. uh, once again, you know, I wish you all the best and please uh, stay healthy and stay well, everybody. Same here. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye bye. Good night. Bye. Thank you everyone for sparing bye -bye. your valuable time. Thank, thank you. you. This talk is thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Keshe, very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Keshe.